Okay. Welcome everyone to our presentation on teaching students hand hygiene routines, physical distancing, and how to wear a face mask. So my name is Becky Carter. I'm a psychologist and a board certified behavior analyst uh, with the Old Ottawa Catholic School Board. And I'm co-presenting with my colleague, Sarah Prince, who is a behavior analyst and also a board certified uh, behavior analyst. So before we start, we just wanted to give a little disclaimer that we are uh, we're not medical doctors, experts on masks, or experts on the trans transmission of COVID-19. So the information uh, presented in this webinar is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice. However, what we do hope to give is some information based on research and best practices around the the use of face masks and proper hygiene routines from a behavioral teaching perspective. We're hoping that the information discussed in this webinar can help you in teaching your child uh, or your student on how to wear a mask, properly wash their hands, and how to stay two meters apart should you decide that these are relevant goals for you. So for today's topics, we will briefly review the recommendations surrounding COVID-19 safety precautions as they pertain to students who are turning to class in class this fall. Following this, we'll take a look at some evidence-based behavior analytics strategies that can be used to support cooperation with wearing a face mask or covering, uh, to teach independent hand washing routines, and to teach how to recognize and engage in proper physical distancing. So these important uh, three important health recommendations can help make your child or teen's return to school a safe and successful one. So the Ottawa Public Health and the Public Health Agency of Canada have recommended three important actions that can help slow the spread of COVID-19 virus. These three actions are wearing a face mask, engaging in proper physical distancing, and frequently washing hands. Based on recommendations of the Ministry of Education, the use of masks is mandatory for students in grade four to 12 and is recommended for kindergarten to grade three. Based on recommend, sorry, when the children and teens wear a face mask, they help protect their classmates and school staff from getting the virus if they may be carrying it. And when others wear masks, they protect your child and teens. Then maintaining physical distancing and frequently washing your hands helps you to protect yourself as well as others. This is an excerpt from the Ottawa Public Health website reviewing why masks have become mandatory in public locations. This includes schools for grades four to 12 and why they are being recommended for students in kindergarten to grade three. So the website explains that wearing a mask does help to reduce the spread of COVID-19, that there is research that shows increased benefits when masks are worn properly, and wearing a mask does not replace other protective measures, including physical distancing, hand washing, covering while coughing and sneezing, not touching your eyes or your face with unwashed hands, self-monitoring for symptoms of COVID-19, and staying home when you are sick. Each school team is incorporating on these, in, putting these extra precautions into your child and teen's days. It also mentions that masks are not required for young children under two or people with medical conditions, disabilities that prevent them from safely wearing a mask, or people who cannot put on or remove their masks without assistance. So schools are recognizing these exceptions, so please talk to your school team if you have any concerns. However, if your child or teen, if having your child or teen wear a mask properly at school is your goal, we will be discussing different ways on how to teach this and how to help increase cooperation with wearing a mask for longer durations of time in our upcoming slides. So let's get started. First, we're gonna talk about how we can support your child and teen who is currently uncomfortable with wearing a face mask, but wishes to do so in class this fall. Our strategies discussed will focus on how to increase cooperation with wearing a face mask or a face covering. So please note that working on cooperation, before working on cooperation, we should teach how to properly wear a mask first. Ottawa Public Health has a great infographic on how to safely put on and remove a facial mask. Some important points include securing the mask over your nose, your mouth, and your chin with no gaps, removing the mask without touching the side um, that faces outwards, and properly disposing your mask into a plastic bag. So I've seen some great tips and posts on social media um, of mask tips, 
that can be placed in the student's backpack. And one in particular that caught my eye was a kit that was made from a hard pencil, pencil case, which had a little bottle of a sanitizer, two masks, and two small Ziploc bags for storing the mask after its use. So I thought this may be a good idea for the fall. So as mentioned earlier, wearing a mask, washing hands, and physical distancing is the best way to slow the spread of COVID-19, especially indoors like schools and classrooms. This situation is all new for us, and there is no research on behavioral techniques to approve these exact behaviors. However, there is a body of evidence-based research that uses behavior analytic techniques to teach similar expectations. So the pictures in this slide are a couple examples where behavior analysis has been successful in promoting safe hand hygiene or safe hygiene um, techniques or supporting individuals in becoming more willing to engage in less desirable medical related requirements. So this is like uh, visiting the doctor or the dentist, getting blood work done, brushing teeth, getting a haircut, wearing glasses or wearing a medical alert bracelet. The techniques used in these studies are listed here in the middle. Now, not all of these will fit your situation, but a combination of some could be used to increase cooperation related to new requirements related to COVID-19 safety precautions. So in the upcoming slides, we're going to discuss specific details on how these um, techniques here in this slide can relate to increasing cooperation with wearing a face mask or a face covering. Okay, so one of the first things we want to talk about is offering choice. So offering choice is a long-standing history of assisting with cooperation, as Sarah mentioned. So we can really borrow from other uh, literature and apply it here as well. One of the first choices you can offer is to allow your child to help pick out a couple of different uh, masks based on their own interests or preferences, and also what's comfortable. Since there's so many different types of masks out there, so some go behind the ear, some tie behind the head, Testing out a few different types might be helpful for, um, for you and your, and your child. Once your child or adolescent has picked out a couple that you think might work, give him or her the choice of which one they would like to wear that day or for that practice trial when you're first teaching. So you can hold up uh, two or three masks and say, which one would you like to wear? This one or this one? Having a few masks on hand can be really helpful. Um, one, they need to be washed, so you need to have extras. Two, your child might start to identify which ones are their favorites or more comfortable to them. And three, you wanna be able to give them that, that choice so that they feel that they have some um, control over the situation where they have to wear a mask. So modeling is a simple strategy that involves finding someone to wear a mask as a model to support others to wear one. So this can be you as a parent while you're working on supporting your child wearing a mask. Um, it could be you helping your child put masks on their favorite stuffies or dolls, and so the dolls become the models. Um, or it could be family members, preferred friends, or even future classmates modeling mask wearing while out in public. So some of the best models are ones that your child and teen can relate to, whether it is because they're of similar age or they're people they admire and look up to, kind of like baby yoga baby Yoda here. Um, but if you're a big Star Wars fan, I've been told that it's not baby Yoda, it's actually called the child. <laughs> okay, so another technique is using social stories or social narratives. Although not considered evidence based on its own, the use of social um, stories can be helpful when explaining the rules or steps to wearing a mask and the why. So Social stories are um, a sequence of pictures and sentences to help prepare someone for a new experience. So think of a social story as a set of instructions to help enhance your teaching program. So there's tons of both detailed and really simple uh, social stories out there as well as social stories related to COVID-19 um, in general that, that are free. And we put a number of examples in our um, resource section at the end of the presentation that we'll make sure that you um, get access to. However, sometimes simply creating your own narrative uh, with pictures of your own child, their mass, their community um, is what works best for your child. So when writing your own, you wanna use uh, written descriptions that include the target behavior. So in this case, it's, it's wearing the mask. 
um, situations where the target behavior should occur. So at school or at the grocery store. Uh, the likely outcome of performing that behavior. So if you wear your mask, you can go to school or you can get a reward um, or you can go shopping. We usually write social stories in the first person, so using the word I, or sometimes uh, using some people from that perspective. You can use pictures, whether they're um, taken from the internet or real pictures to help um, assist with comprehension. And you wanna include information about the who, what, when, where, and the why. So I know you might be thinking that there are not enough social stories in the world that's gonna get your child to wear a mask. And I completely agree with you. So this is why this is one suggestion that's likely to be more effective when um, combined with the other behavior analytic techniques that Sarah and I are, are discussing, um, such as you know offering choice and modeling and the other things that we'll talk about um, upcoming. So I'm just gonna give you uh, here's one simple example of wearing a mask to school social story from Autism Little Helpers, um, which is in the resource section. So I'm just going to toggle through really quickly, but as you can see, and I'm not going to read it to you, but here is my school wants kids and adults to wear masks. So it's already setting up the target behavior and the where. As we move forward, it's setting up the why and potential issues of wearing a mask. These are the rules and choices that are built in. Um, other rules about wearing a mask. And finally, ending with a positive statement and some encouragement. So you might find some of these uh, helpful. So fading or stimulus fading is another behavioral technique where we gradually change our expectation related to a specific behavior. So in our case, it's wearing a face mask. Our aim is to slowly increase what we're asking our child or teen to cooperate with. This gradual slow paced, slow paced nature of the strategy helps to keep both you, the parent, and your child relaxed and focused on the smaller, more attainable steps towards your ultimate goal of wearing a face mask while in class. So the strategy starts by focusing on one low effort expectation, usually one that's really easily attained, then once that's been attained successfully, you introduce the next, next incrementally higher expectation. And I usually strive for my students to do at least this three times in a row with no help in order to, um, for that step to be obtained. Um, I try to avoid just having one success and moving on. I typically prefer three or more successes. So then gradually as each step becomes comfortable, your child and teen for your child and teen, you work through each incremental increase till you reach your ultimate goal. So to reach your ultimate goal, you would practice your target step multiple times throughout the day. This isn't meant to be all done at once, and typically in the literature or in my own practice, I've stayed at each step for at least three consecutive days before I move on to the next step. The most important part of the strategy is to let your child and teen's performance guide when you increase. If they're having a hard time at one step, stay there and keep practicing. Eventually, comfort levels will adjust and they will be able and ready to go on to that next step. And don't worry, progress is never linear and it's never been linear in my practice. Your child and teen may spend more time on one step than the other, that's okay. And sometimes you may um, have increased too quickly um, and need to backstep a bit and try um, to increase again in the future. And that's also very okay. Mm -hmm. As your child and teen goes through each step, ensure that you're providing reinforcement. And Becky's gonna get into that a little bit too. Um, but a bonus to increase success as you work through each incremental increase is to use differential reinforcement, which is a strategy where you provide reinforcement to match the effort of the skill. So in the beginning, when you only require them to just touch a mask, um, you give praise and kisses, um, but then as you eventually increase through those incremental steps and you're at maybe around 15 minutes, um, you give access to preferred popsicle, popsicle or um, 15 minutes on the iPad or something that kind of matches that effort that they um, put out. <clears throat> so here's a gradual feeding procedure that I've used at home. 
we started small and then we gradually built up. And then actually once I got to the two minute mark, which is four steps down, I started doing the practice outside of the community um, for the target time. So we would put our masks on, go step into the library, grab our books, which usually lasted about two minutes, came out of the library and then took our masks off. So gradually we built this up to 15 minutes of walking around in a store or a community location with our masks on. Um, for those of you who have children who can tolerate those 15 minutes but are really worried about those long school or classroom days, I highly recommend working on half hour or hour increments um, up to about five hours with your mask on. Now this may seem like long durations, but students will be engaged in what we call um, distracting stimuli during class. So this could be um, academic work, um, peer socialization, all that. Um, so Becky's gonna touch on that in a couple minutes. However, practicing those longer hours while watching a movie, playing Lego, playing a video game, can help your child and teen become accustomed to the feeling of the mask in the beginning um, when they may be a little bit uncomfortable in the beginning. <clears throat> so a lot of child and teens may need to uh, that first step um, of the green of the one second be broken down a lot further um, because even that one second can cause distress and discomfort. So here's an example of those steps being broken down a little bit further. So first, um, touch the mask with your hands, touch it to your cheek, maybe hold it on your face, loop it just on one ear, then loop it on two ears, and then you can go back into those greens of increasing that time frame. <clears throat> So for those that find it difficult to breathe when the mask is over their face, and this was something that my um, sons had a difficulty with, consider varying the position of the mask from on your face, but off your mouth and nose, just all the way up to the proper position. So here's an example here where it's under your chin, then on your mouth, under your nose, and then secured properly in the proper position. Either way, ensure that the steps that you create suit your child and teen and the specific discomfort about wearing the mask that they're experiencing. <clears throat> okay, so to build upon Sarah's, uh, the fading procedures that Sarah went over, uh, she, she touched on providing reinforcement or rewards as a way to keep your child motivated and really to praise them for, the, for cooperating each step of the way. So the goal is to hopefully increase your child's motivation to cooperate with wearing a mask when you go to practice the next time or when you're in the community or when you're at, when you're at school. So what reward you choose for your child is gonna be highly individual, individualized and depend on what he or she likes. So some examples of reinforcement could include social praise from you um, or another uh, person. So this can be in, in the form of just giving a high five, um, verbal praise, like saying awesome job wearing your mask, and uh, giving smiles and, and tickles. Sometimes access to favorite activities or toys is what's going to motivate your child. So perhaps wearing, after wearing a mask, you'll go on a special outing to the swing set or beach or access to a favorite toy or technology, or maybe at special time with you. So it's important to remember to keep in mind that these skills might be difficult and that it's okay to provide our reinforcement or, or rewards to help keep that momentum uh, going. Whatever reward you do choose, it's important to let you know, your child know when that reward is actually coming and what he or she needs to do in order to get that reward. And it should immediately follow cooperation with mask wearing. So for example, say your goal is to wear the mask for five seconds. So thinking about Sarah's fading uh, procedure. You can use a timer on your phone or the microwave or a visual timer, or you can just simply count out loud. Sometimes what happens if there's a lag between the target behavior, so wearing the mask um, and the reinforcer, we can inadvertently uh, reward other behavior and it might become confusing to your child as to what they're actually receiving that reward for. So we wanna keep it as close in time as possible. The goal is to gradually build wearing a mask into your child's daily schedule. So for instance, to build up wearing a mask for the entire trip to the grocery store or for an entire school period. Once the target goal has been met, then we are going to immediately deliver the reward. And we're gonna show some videos about this. 
So here uh, is a video coming up demonstrating choice fading. So our goal in the video is only to wear the mask for 10 seconds uh, using a visual timer and using reinforcement. So this is me and my uh, daughter. We're going to practice wearing your mask, okay? All right. So when we're done, what would you like to play with? Your bunny or your doggy? Your doggy. And which mask would you like to wear? Your blue one or your white one? Okay. You take blue, you put it on. And I'm going to set the timer for 10 seconds. Okay. Show. Doing great. Okay, time's up. Great job wearing your mask. You can play as your doggy. So I just wanted to add in that video to that giving behavior specific praise. So um, it's okay to say great job, but I labeled great job wearing your mask. So just make sure that you're specific in your praise. So another behavioral analytic technique is using distracting stimuli. So in addition to reinforcement for wearing a mask, you can engage your child in a preferred activity while wearing the mask as kind of as a way of distracting them while wearing it for longer periods of time. So this is really anything over uh, two minutes. So if we're thinking about Sarah's, uh, the fading step she, she mentioned. And we actually do this all the time in our daily lives. So when I'm at the dentist, sometimes I might listen to my favorite music as a way of kind of escaping the noise of, of a drill or a procedure. Or for my children, they have the TV on the ceiling of the dentist's office, for example. My daughter wears an eye patch and she doesn't like it. So in a way to engage her is I let her do her favorite things like watching TV or reading her a book um, as a way to kind of distract her when she has to keep that eye, pa um, eye patch on. So combining this with rewards that we just spoke about um, can be uh, really helpful. So let's give um, an example. So here's a video of my son and we're demonstrating giving a choice modeling. So I'm gonna wear the mask as well. We're only working on 30 seconds here for the sake of the video. But again, you usually wanna use distracting stimuli when you're kind of working over that two minute mark. Okay, Elliot. Wearing your mask, um, and you can do your puzzle, which is a preferred activity for you. You like puzzles, don't you? Okay, which mask do you like? This one? Okay, I'm going to wear mine with you. Ready? All right. Perfect job. I'm going to start a timer. Go ahead. All right, Sarah. So when working with uh, on attainable goals while wearing a face mask, it's important to try and prevent your child and teen from removing the mask before the goal time frame is reached. So in Becky's video, that was before the timer had gone off. So this may include stopping them from raising their hands to remove their mask. Now, please note that this is not the one and only strategy that should be used. It should always be coupled with, cu coupled with a fading strategy that's small, comfortable, with easy attainable steps. <clears throat> However, this is an important strategy to use as it helps to support your child and teen to know the expectation and to stick with it. So for example, if um, keeping the mask on for one minute and not actually reaching to remove it. So our goal here is not to use this strategy often. If you're finding yourself using it two to three times when you're on a certain step, I would actually reevaluate that step and see if you need to break it down a little bit more. 
So for example, if you started your first fading procedure um, in the green here on the left-hand side by putting the mask on for one second, um, but you're finding that you're having to block your child or teen from removing the mask as you work on that first step, this may be a great indication that this step is just too much for them. So instead, break that first step down a little bit more like I did here on the purple side. Start with touching the mask with their hands, working through each of those purple. And once you get to the bottom where it says gradually increase time, then you can go back up and try that one second. And by that time, they may be comfortable enough to just have that mask on for one second. <clears throat> so here's an example of me working with my son, Cameron, who was the only willing um, child that I had in my current bubble right now. Um, we're working on removing the mask while we try our new step of wearing it for three seconds. So in this video, you'll also know me using choice modeling um, my fading techniques of 30 seconds and reinforcement. So you'll notice that Cam had a hard time at that 30 seconds and what I just did at our next practice is I just reevaluated that 30 seconds, brought it back down to 20 and he was successful again. I think you also noticed my little one trying to show his skills in the background. <laughs> um, so here's another strategy. So as you continue to work on wearing a mask for longer periods of time, it will become useful to teach your child or teen to ask to remove their mask. Um, functional communication strategy is a behavioral technique that teaches simple, a simple request acts as immediate reinforcement related to the function of problem behavior. And so in our case, the problem behavior would be removing the mask before expected or trying to just escape having that mask put on. So in my house, I've taught my children that while we're in public, they can ask for an itch break. Um, when we were wearing masks for a longer period of time, my son was complaining that he couldn't breathe and that his face was so itchy, so he called it an itch break. Um, so I've taken this as a cue that they needed a break. Um, so if we were out in a community for a long period of time wearing that mask, whether we were on a bus or at a, communication, a community location walking to the store, um, they asked for an itch break and we immediately went to find a safe spot. So that it was usually just outside the store. Um, where we would take off our mask, sanitize our hands, they can itch as much as they want, they could take a breather um, before putting the mask back on and then going back into the store. So it may be useful to touch base with your school staff or your teacher to find out if there's a safe, safe 
spot um, where they can remove your, uh, their mask in school or in their classroom. I believe most classes are looking to set up a safe spot in the classroom or school um, that is at a safe distance from other people. So once you've identified this, you can teach your child or teen to ask for a no mask break or an itch break or whatever you choose. Usually I keep it very short, either one word or just a couple words, um, and then they can go to that safe spot. So if you're keen on this, you can even build that into your practice sessions at home while you're working on longer durations of time. So now let's switch our focus to teaching our children and teens to properly wash their hands or sanitize their hands on their own. So doing this independently. We've gone through um, many of these strategies to support cooperation with wearing a mask. However, they're also very transferable to teaching independence with hand hygiene as well. For instance, choice can be incorporated into what soap do you want to use, the uh, pink soap or the blue soap, um, or pick the soap that has a preferable character on it like Minions. Rewards and reinforcement works much the same way as what you would have seen um, while we were talking about masks. So you can even build reinforcement into the routine by incorporating a favorite song um, when singing, when you're scrubbing your hands for 20 seconds. Happy birthday is one that has been used a lot. However, in my house, we made up a, a weird fun dinosaur song because my four-year-old is really big into dinosaurs. You can even have a little reward chart on the wall in the bathroom by the sink in the classroom. So this is where you could put stickers on every time someone in your house um, washes their hands properly. Modeling is also a great strategy that can be used. And even a great strategy with hand washing and modeling is video modeling. So in this case, you'll show a video immediately before your child or teen goes to wash their hands. So they have an appropriate model once they can then do it and try it themselves. Social, story has all, social stories or narratives have also been created to help teach um, the steps of washing your hands. But they've also been um, created to help teach the reason behind washing hands um, is so important in our current climate. And there's two um, social stories that target both of these in the resources that Becky was chatting about at the end of our slides. So lastly here in orange, a great behavioral strategy um, specific to teaching new skills that are part of a sequence of action, so much like hand washing, um, is using a task analysis with chaining procedures. So we're going to explore this in our next couple slides. So a task analysis is really just a fancy behavioral term for writing down all the steps involved um, in a specific task. And really, I just call it making a list of what to do. So in our case, we write down the steps that we need to do in terms of washing our hands. And here are a couple of examples that you'll see in the community. So this one's the one from Ottawa Public Health. I'm sure everyone's aware of it. I believe it's in most uh, community locations. And I think it also is a great emphasis that adults still need sometimes some task analyses as well. I do. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, this one's from the Public Health Agency of Canada and it came out um, with a revised task analysis specific to scrubbing techniques um, to the slow the spread of bacteria or viruses. And so you'll notice the top ones are their old ones and then the bottom ones are those specific scrub techniques. Um, I actually, I'm going to add something in here. The another, oh, sorry, go back up, Becky. Um, those four bottom techniques, if you're looking at just teaching how to use sanitizer, those four techniques would actually be a really great task analysis um, for when you have sanitizer on your hands. So you can change it now. So here's another simple version that I often use just as a visual while I teach students to wash their hands for the very first time. Um, a lot of the times you'll see this in preschools or kindergarten um, washrooms. Um, and you see here how each step is broken down into different steps. Um, this specific image has seven different steps for hand washing. And each step leads to the next. And the combination of all those steps is the hand washing routine. And so that really is what a task analysis is. <clears throat> Um, so when we, we combine our task analysis with chaining, and chaining is really just a complementary procedure that helps you teach each one of those steps that are in your whole routine. So there are different types of chaining teaching procedures, but for the purposes of our webinar, um, we recommend using backwards chaining to teach um, 
hand washing. So this would involve teaching your last step of, in that task analysis. And then once they've learned that last step, you move on to the second last step. So really you're teaching in reverse of the steps and I'll show you how this looks. So in here, if you're gonna use um, this list of steps, you wanna start teaching at step seven where you actually teach them to do it independently. So you'll help them stoop through step one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then you slowly fade your support at seven until they can do it independently. Then when step seven is successful with no help, move on to teach step six and expect your child to do step seven by themselves. So in this case, if I was at this step, I would help them with step one, two, three, four, and five. I would try to fade my support for step six and then I would let them do step seven on their own. And then moving on backwards. And so in this case, I would help them with steps one to four try and take my support for step five and let them do six and seven on their own. So for those of you who have children who can wash their hands independently, but your concern lies with proper hand washing techniques, try to use this task analysis instead um, and backwards chain the four scrubbing techniques that you see here at the bottom. Um, I often find when you're teaching those four scrubbing techniques, it actually ends up lasting close to 20 seconds. So it's, um, it's good to have those four in your repertoire. So um, this is actually the one I've been using in the recent months to teach proper hand washing routine in our house. Um, my children were aware of how to independently wash their hands, but I was really concerned that they weren't really scrubbing properly. So we use this one. And I actually posted these visuals in the washrooms that we have um, in our house. I also recommend these four te techniques um, for hand sanitizer as well. And so if I were to, oops, sorry. Can you go back, Becky? Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, so if I were to teach this, I would get them to do one and two independently. And then when it came to step three, I would do the first three scrubbing techniques. So the palms, the fingers, the nail scrub. And then I would try and fade my support for the thumb rub. And then I would let them do four to six on their own. And I have a video coming up that could show you how this is done. So when using a task analysis and chaining techniques to teach hand hygiene, um, don't forget to provide reinforcement. And I often provide reinforcement or just praise when the student completes the target step. So either one of those scrub techniques or one of the steps that you saw in that list of seven. Um, so I'll give them praise maybe for each one of those. And then once they're done the entire routine, that's really when the reinforcement comes out and I'll put the sticker on the sticker chart or um, whatever my child is discussing. So let's see this in action. In this video, I'm teaching Cam to wash his hands with proper scrubbing techniques, um, which we call the doctor wash in our family. And this was actually Becky's wonderful idea. So I used it in our videos. Um, the first clip you'll notice me washing, um, helping him with the first four techniques. So this is kind of the first time he's seen those um, scrub techniques. And then in the second clip, you'll actually see me fade support on the last two, which is the nail scrub and the thumb wash. going to help you with the doctor wash part, okay? All right, you start it off and I'll help you when the doctor wash part comes in.
two things all by yourself. That's awesome. Mm, good job, buddy. Oh, you'll see that he's still working on the nail scrub and the thumb, but uh, we're getting there. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to move on uh, to our last topic. So using behavior analytic techniques to recognize and participate in safe physical distancing. So Ottawa Public Health recommends physical distancing by ensuring whenever possible, you remain uh, more than two meters or six feet away from people you interact with outside of your household. So we've discussed some of these strategies uh, throughout the presentation with wearing a mask or with Sarah teaching uh, proper hyg hand hygiene routines. And we can also use these for maintaining physical distance from others. Um, so for example, with modeling, um, especially with live modeling, and we'll show this a little bit, can be used to show your child physical distance of two meters, as well as examples of what less than two meters looks like. Uh, reinforcement works much the same way as we explained with wearing a mask and hand hygiene. With all the strategies for physical distance that we'll discuss, you can enhance the effectiveness by building in reinforcement or rewards when your child correctly identifies or shows you or adheres to a minimum, a minimum physical distance standards. Social stories have also been created to help teach the reasons behind why physical distancing is so important and how to maintain um, social or physical distance. So again, in the resource section, we have a couple of video as well as um, social stories about this. So something I wanna introduce you to is another really good behavior analytic technique um, that you can use to teach physical distancing, and it's called discrimination training. So in discrimination training, we are teaching the child how to identify the difference between or discriminate between what is considered two meters apart and what isn't two meters apart. So when using discrimination training uh, for the purposes of this um, webinar, we would recommend this process. So begin using pictures, and we'll break this down over the next few slides, then move to using real life models, and then finally practicing in the real world. So when using uh, discrimination training using pictures, the overall goal is for your child to be able to identify which pictures show two people physical distancing by two meters from those who are not. So to do this, you're gonna show your child multiple pictures of what uh, people two meters apart, pictures that show people who are not two meters apart. And then you're gonna ask your child to identify which one shows two meters apart and which one does not. So it's important to teach multiple examples. So you want to sure, make sure that your child really understands these concepts and you want to change up the settings and the people. So we can practice this. So if I was showing these pictures to um, a child or a student, I would say, okay, do the children in the first picture show two meters apart? No, they don't. What about the children in the second picture? Do they show two meters apart? Yes, they do, or roughly so. So here's another example with learners in the classroom. So does the first picture show children who are uh, two meters apart? No. And what about the second picture? Yes, they do. So just a note, depending on what classroom your students are, your child is in, some classes might use the phys one meter physical distancing with a mask rule or two meters. So just be cognizant of where your child's going to be going in the fall. So after your child has been able to discriminate two meter pictures from non two meter pictures, you can move to re using real people. So you wanna to try to find two models in real life. So this could be mom and dad, siblings, friends, and have them stand at varying distances. And you're really just gonna ask your child, are they two meters apart? The child's gonna answer yes or no, and then you're gonna reinforce accordingly. So in this picture, I was trying to capture a real life situ situation, so just not just the picture, of me asking, going through this process with my daughter. So my daughter would ask, so 
is dad and your brother Elliot standing two meters apart? And she's giving the thumbs up. Yes, they are. You can also totally make this a game and practice at the park or other locations and just say, hey, are they two meters apart? Are they two meters apart? And just providing that praise afterwards. The third step used in discrimination training is to pra actually practice it outside in the real world or inside your house by instructing your child, okay, show me what two meters apart from another person would look like. So when first teaching your child this, you can use a prompt to help your child be more successful. So for example, some prompts that I see people using in the community are pool noodles or just simply using a meter, uh, a couple of meter sticks, you know, taped together. Or we see all the time tape on the ground to show us what two meters look like. So those are all prompts that we can use to help really teach us what that two meter distance actually looks like. And it really is helpful to make sure that your uh, child is being successful with it. So you'll notice that in some places, these prompts won't be faded. So uh, for example, at school or at the grocery store, there's gonna be markers on the floor. In school, there's gonna be markers in the hallways and the classrooms that show what two meters looks like. And they won't be refaded or removed until the risk of COVID-19 is substantially reduced. However, when you're teaching at home, you might wanna consider gradually fading back any prompts that you're using when you're doing your in person rehearsals. So in other words, you want to gradually remove that pool noodle, the meter stick, or the tape that you're using at home that shows your child that two meter, um, that two, two meters. So a couple ways that you, you could do this is by um, removing the pool noodle because they're quite thick and moving to a meter stick because it's smaller, then moving maybe to a piece of string. So you're kind of gradually removing how, how big it is or the color, so it's getting kind of smaller. So a note of caution when you're trying to fade back, so starting to remove those physical prompts is to not go too fast or too slow. So as Sarah mentioned before, um, let your child's progress be your guide. If you fade back and you realize that your child isn't successful at showing you what two meters looks like, go back to the last step. So when we teach using behavioral techniques, we like to know if what we're doing is working. And so we do this by keeping track of progress. This helps eliminate us from having to remember what happened last time um, or from letting that one difficult practice really cloud our judgment on whether what we're doing is working or not. So tracking helps us to know when to move up a step in the fading procedure or keep going or when to revise. Um, so a catchphrase I always say is let performance guide your progress. Never move on if your child or teen's progress is touch and go. Ultimately, we're letting them guide us through the next steps. So if their performance is successful, move on. Um, and if their performance is touch and go or it's a little variable, try something different, maybe revise it or just stay there and kind of work through it. Um, much like the video we showed you um, with Cameron and I preventing the removing of the mask. So in this video, um, we noticed that after two times at 30 seconds that he was having a hard time. So uh, instead of moving on because it wasn't successful, it was a little bit variable, I decided to revise it to that 20 seconds. Um, and now you don't always have to work backwards. There's other revisions that you can do. Another revision would be to maybe um, change the reinforcement that you're using. So sometimes if the effort's a little bit harder for them, increase the incentive. So instead of praise, provide that preferred popsicle. Um, or change the prompt or the strategy that you're using. Um, so maybe have another model in there that's also wearing a mask or read a social story um, of why we wear masks as a reminder right prior to doing that practice. So those are just a couple ways of revising. So a simple way to track progress is really to just put a plus or a minus on a tracking sheet with the date and the step that you're focusing on. And so you can see here in this pink posting note, um, that's our hand washing tracking. Um, and so you can see that on their first practice on August 8th, uh, we had two pluses and a minus, and then we decided not to move on. Um, and then on August 10th, three pluses, August 11th, three pluses. So you know what, we decided to move on up to um, the next step of nails and thumb scrub. 
Um, so on August 12th, there was a minus, a plus, and a minus. So um, today, I believe is the, oh, no, today is the dog. Um, so tomorrow, we are going to try this test. And one of the last things that we're going to touch on uh, for this webinar is, is generalization. So once you start to make progress in any of uh, the three situations, so wearing a mask, proper um, height, hand hygiene, um, or physical distancing, it's going to be really important to practice those newly learned skills in other places and with other people. Um, so for example, have your child wear a mask in the grocery store on the playground in addition to at home. Have your child practice washing their hand routine at grandma's house too or other people who are in your uh, bubble. Physical, practice physical distancing in the backyard or you know, in, at, at school or in church. So the, it's, it's important to make sure that we're practicing these outside of the conditions in which they were originally taught. So we want to thank you really um, very much for, for joining uh, us and watching this presentation. When in doubt, please follow Ottawa Public Health and the Ottawa Catholic School Board uh, for, for updates. And you can also follow um, the ABA and Autism team on Twitter at OCSBT. Um, in the, um, in the comment section below in the description on YouTube, I will make sure that I put all the resource, resources for wearing masks, hand washing, physical distancing as well. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you guys.